what you came up with and talk about it with each other. And um, cause that's another just incredible passage that you really can learn a lot from. And it's always worth again, spending more time in scripture. So we good to go, Steve. Steve, we're good. good to go. Okay. All right. All right. So, and this week we're given the opportunity then to study this uh, amazing passage of John 15, which is right in the middle of this farewell discourse. So you remember that John's gospel started with the prologue, and then it covered the book of signs, which included uh, many of these miracles from Jesus, and began introducing who Jesus really is to us by explaining these I am statements. And Jesus then made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. He washed his disciples' feet. Judas had left the twelve to go and betray Jesus. And now we're studying the final words that Jesus gives to his disciples, which happened before his departure, because he's preparing them for his departure. He's preparing them to leave. Jesus wants his disciples to be prepared for his departure. And he's already taught them several things. These are things that we've looked at already, that they are to believe in God that they are to trust that Jesus is going away to prepare a place for them. He taught them that He is the way and the truth and the life. Jesus is the way to the Father. The disciples then will continue the ministry that Jesus has started by doing even greater works than He. These are all things that we looked at last week. And also in chapter 14, we saw that Jesus promised to send another advocate, which is the spirit of truth, to live inside Christians, to teach them all things, to remind the disciples of everything that Jesus had said to them. And all of these are to be comforting words to them, which will prepare the disciples. It will ease their troubled hearts. And so then in the midst of this, the disciples are commanded to obey Jesus as a demonstration of their love for Jesus, and they are commanded to love one another. These are all things we've just covered in these last two chapters. So chapter chapter 14 contained quite a bit of teaching about Jesus and quite a bit of teaching about the Holy Spirit. And next week in chapter 16, there's going to be a lot of teaching again about the Holy Spirit. This is what Jesus covers in his farewell discourse. This week, the disciples are instructed to remain in Jesus. And doing so will result in the bearing of fruit. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives as well. So three divisions tonight. We have vine and branches, which is verses 1 to 8. We have love and friendship, which is verses 9 to 17. And hatred and unity, which is 18 to 25. So chapter 15 begins with the seventh and final I am statement in the Gospel of John. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. This is the only statement that includes the Father in the explanation. You notice it mentions the Father is the gardener. But Jesus is the true vine. There's some debate as to whether this first part of this chapter is to be considered a parable, or if this is a a metaphor, but it, it doesn't really make that much difference. The point is that Jesus promised an advocate to his disciples, and now he's providing an analogy or an explanation to show what this advocate looks like. And he shows them that believers have no spiritual life unless they are totally connected to Christ. Vines and vineyards are frequently used in the Old Testament as metaphors, especially for Israel. We saw this several times last year uh, as we were going through some of the Old Testament, but I'll just give you one example. Isaiah 5, 7 says, The vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel. So again, this is an example of of, uh, the vine or the vineyard representing Israel. That passage goes on, And the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but saw bloodshed, for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. So in most of the circumstances in the Old Testament, when vines are mentioned, it's in reference to the fact that those vines are not producing good fruit. Uh, Specifically, that the nation of Israel is not producing fruit. It's not producing the spiritual fruit in the way that they ought. 
So by Jesus stating, I am the true vine, he is saying something profound. He's coming as the Messiah, and that act of him coming has superseded the nation of Israel as the focal point for the people of God. Throughout these various lessons, I don't have time to revisit all those things now, but we have seen Jesus demonstrate his uh, superiority over the temple. We've seen him uh, show his superiority over the Jewish feasts and over Moses and over some of the holy places. By claiming to be the true vine, he is claiming to replace Israel as the center or the hub for the people of God. Jesus is now the center for the people of God, and everything grows out from him. The father in this analogy is the gardener. He cuts off every branch that bears no fruit. Also, he prunes every branch that does bear fruit in order that it might be even more fruitful. We understand this. You know, in order for an apple tree to produce uh, more fruit, you need to trim things back. You need to trim some of the leaves so that the sunlight can reach the good branches so that there's enough room for the plants to grow and for the fruit to grow. The bad branches are removed, and it's the same with the vine and the vineyard. God is constantly working to make the fruitful branches more fruitful. This pruning from the Father is necessary then for our spiritual growth. James chapter 1 and Hebrews chapter 12 are great passages to describe this sort of thing. They describe that the hardships in life are necessary to produce spiritual maturity for us. We've got to understand that discipline is not pleasant at the time, but it is for our good in order that we may share in the holiness of God. Hebrews 12, 11 says, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. So it's clear, though, that the branches of the vine are supposed to bear fruit. That's why the branches are there, is in order to bear fruit. That's part of their purpose. So what is bearing fruit? Well, when you look at the context of this passage, you get some clues to what bearing fruit looks like. Um, for instance, verse 9 shows bearing fruit is loving God and loving one another. Verse 10 describes bearing fruit as being obedient to God's commands. Verse 11 describes experiencing joy in any circumstance. And of course, we often consider what the Apostle Paul wrote to the Galatians in chapter 5 regarding the fruits of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. I can't think of a time in my life where I've studied the fruits of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5 and not also studied John 15 at the same time. These two chapters are so closely connected, so it makes sense as we're studying John chapter 15 to also think about Galatians 5 and what it says about the fruits of the Spirit. They're so clearly connected. And it is so clear that in no way can we produce the fruits of the Spirit without the Spirit. And in no way can we produce the fruits of the Spirit without remaining attached to the vine, who is Christ. Through the vine, all of the water and the nourishment that the branches need flows. We're unable to do the work that God requires us apart from being connected to Jesus, the true vine, through the Holy Spirit. There are no rogue branches you can't go off on your own and do the works of God or bear meaningful fruit without remaining in Christ. Verse 4 says, Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. 
If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I love that question in your lesson this week, uh, where the answer was no. Can, can someone bear fruit apart from knowing Christ? The answer is no, you cannot. It's very clear. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So the first principle, true disciples remain in Christ and bear fruit. True disciples remain in Christ and bear fruit. So is your life bearing fruit? Often we start at the wrong place. You know, we notice that we are impatient, for instance. And so we try and try and try to be more patient. Or we notice we're unkind. And so we try to be more kind. Well, Christ did not come just to modify our behavior. He came to die as our sacrifice and to rule as king. Therefore, what is required of us is total allegiance to Christ. When we struggle with impatience or lack of self-control, that is evidence that we have not truly and fully given our allegiance to Christ. As we do that, as we remain in Him, the true vine, our lives are transformed such that we are people who bear the fruits of the Spirit. So are you impatient? Are you struggling with the fruits of the Spirit? Then what is your relationship with the Lord like? Are you truly a disciple? Have you surrendered your life to Christ? That's the question we must ask. God prunes the branches. He prunes our lives so that we do bear fruit. As verse 8 says, As verse 8 says, this is to the Father's glory that we bear much fruit. This bearing of fruit is the best indicator of your true discipleship because true disciples remain connected to Christ and in so doing they bear fruit, which shows them to be true disciples. So this passage demands that we take a sobering look in the mirror We can't hide from this passage. We can't bear fruit apart from Christ. Yet all those in Christ do bear fruit. If your life is not bearing fruit, or if the people you thought were Christians, or have at some point in the past claimed to be Christians, yet there is no evidence of fruit in their lives or in your life, then you cannot conclude that there is true discipleship. Those sound like, withering branches that are thrown into the fire and burned. One of the the themes that we've just seen repeatedly in John is the love of the Father and the Son and this unity that they have, the, the oneness that they have. We've seen the Son's absolute commitment to the will of the Father, Uh, that kind of self-sacrifice on behalf of another is described in these verses as the greatest form of love. Love is more than warm feelings we get on Valentine's Day. This is responsible and sacrificial love that's not spur of the moment, but is consistent. It's eternal. Verse verse 9. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in His love. Not one time, not one time did Jesus ever overstep His bounds. Not one time did He ever use His power inappropriately. Not one time did He ever uh, bring disgrace upon the Father. In the way in which the Father loved Jesus, so also Jesus loved His disciples in that same way. Remember, John told us that He loved His disciples till the end, and He's explaining the depth of His love to prepare the disciples for His departure. So, what brought 
their response um, to the, uh, I'm sorry, what ought, excuse me, what ought their response to this love be, this love from Christ? How should the, the disciples respond? How are you to respond when you consider that the same way in which the Father loved the Son, Jesus loves you if you are his disciple? Verse 11, it says this, I have told you this, all about this love, I've told you all about that, so that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be complete. The answer is joy. Our response to hearing about the love of Christ ought to be joy. In fact, complete joy, utter joy, joy that is lacking nothing. When we hear about the vine and the branches, we can get caught up in in what we have to do or what we have not to do. We can get caught up in not trying to do things on our own strength, but we ought to stop for a minute and consider the joy that comes from being loved by Jesus. The joy that comes from being connected to the vine. Disciples can not only be happy, but they can be full of joy knowing that they belong to Christ. They are connected to the God of the universe. They are enveloped in God's love. And it's because of this love that we can love others. And that the disciples can love one another. In fact, not only can we do it, but we are commanded to do it. And this is what the church is about. God's people gathering to worship Jesus and to love one another. How have you benefited from the love of God's people? Is the church central to your life? Christians are part of the family of God. You were born into a family, and then when you got saved, you were born into a different family, into another family, the people of God. Are the people of God benefiting from your involvement in their lives? Jesus would expect the answer to be yes. And those who do this are the friends of God. You know, it's a challenge to accurately describe God. And this is so important because we must know and understand who God truly is. The best way to know God is to see who He is in His Word. Because not only do we see that God is the all-powerful, eternal Creator who knows all things, the one who has dominion over all things and needs counsel from no one. But also this same God has brought life to mankind. He has come to his people. He has brought new life to his people. He's displayed his love for them. He has been for them a light, a shepherd, their bread, their resurrection, the vine that sustains them, and now their friend. Verse 15, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friend. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You don't get to choose your parents. You don't get to choose your brothers or your sisters. You usually don't get to choose your neighbors or your coworkers. But you do get to choose your friends. And if you are a disciple of Jesus, he chose you to be his friend. Verse 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. Second principle, true disciples are Jesus, I'm sorry, true disciples are friends of Jesus and love each other. True disciples are friends of Jesus and love each other. All right, I want to tell you something that I don't believe in. 
<laughs> so that I can illustrate what I do believe, if that makes sense, what the Bible says, okay? So this is, I just want to tell you that up front, this is what I don't believe in. Some of you may have heard of these things. Um, there's some research done looking at these places called blue zones, and these are locations in the world where people consistently live longer uh, in, than other places. And often they're more productive lives, and they say more satisfying lives for people even into their late 90s or early 100s. And so people see that. They've studied these places because they want to know the secrets. They want to determine why these types of people have such longevity and such meaningful life. And one of these places study was in Japan. And uh, the researchers went and talked to the people. And in doing so, they discovered that the people talked about something called an ikigai. Spelled I-K-I-G-A-I. Again, this is something I do not believe in. Essentially, this was a person's reason for living. Uh, it was the reason for getting up each and every day. And uh, I heard about this. I'd seen a documentary about this. And then it came up in a secular leadership context where I was instructed to find my ikigai. This would be good for me. And here's how you do it. The way you do this is to answer a few simple questions. The first is, what am I good at? And this is like a Venn diagram, okay? There's like a circle, like, what am I good at? Then the next one is, what do I love? And then, what does the world need? And inside of that, you should be able to find where all those merge together. But of course, this is the West. And so we've added one other thing, which is, what can I get paid for? <laughs> and that's supposed to fit in there too. And you sort of fuse the answers to these questions together and you find your ikigai. And the example that was given was that of a 92-year-old fisherman in Japan who continued to live a productive and meaningful life because he was good at fishing, he loved fishing, and the world needed fish. So I want to reiterate again that I don't agree with this line of thinking because the Bible teaches something completely different. We can't ask a few simple questions and find our purpose in life because God already gave us our purpose. I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit. You were created by God to glorify God. The purpose of every human being, the reason you ought to get up every single morning is to glorify God. So what do we love? We love God, but only because he first loved us. It wasn't our idea, it was his idea. In fact, he loved us so much that he created us in his image. Our self-worth, therefore, is not wrapped up in what we can do well. But our self-worth is wrapped up in the fact that God has to have worth. God created us to have worth, and in offering himself as the ultimate sacrifice and saving his people, he has shown them to be his treasured possession. Therefore, the question of what am I good at has no business being in a discussion about the reason for living. Whether or not you are good at something does not affect your purpose. You were created to glorify God. You were created in God's image. You were created to do good works, which God prepared in advance for you to do. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can only bring glory to God if you are naturally gifted at something. So what does the world need? Well, it needs more than fish, I'll tell you that much. Uh, in part, the world needs to see that the world does not revolve around them. You know, just consider how selfish this is to say that I live for what I love and what I am good at and for what I can get paid for. This is I, I, I. That's what gives me meaning is I give myself meaning. The Bible is very clear that what the world needs is to repent of its rebellion against God. 
And the world needs to turn and to worship Jesus as the sovereign and resurrected King. God has given us our purpose. Christians remain connected to the vine. And in so doing, they glorify God with their lives. This purpose never has an age limit. If you one day stop working, your reason for living is totally unaffected. You still exist to glorify God. If everyone and everything you love goes away, it doesn't matter. You still have Christ. If the whole world decides that it doesn't need you, that's fine. It decided it didn't need Jesus either, when in fact, he was the only one that they needed. And I think one of the ways I've grown most in spiritual maturity over the last several years is the way in which I've grown to see the difference in the ways of the world and the truths of the gospel. By remaining in Christ, I have learned what the Bible teaches is right and true rather than what man has decided they think or feel is right. There are those who are in Christ and there are those who are not in Christ. And the world is made up of all those not in Christ. The world is in opposition to God. Remaining in Christ, being connected to the vine means having the Holy Spirit. Listen to how Paul, listen to how Paul describes this. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 12 to 16. Again, this is the difference between the mindset of the world and the mindset of those who have the Spirit. What we have received is not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, explaining spiritual realities with Spirit-taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? but we have the mind of Christ. So there's a, a distinction between life with the Spirit and life without the Spirit. Life connected to the vine and the foolishness of the world. Not only are the actions different, but the thoughts are different. The whole way of viewing the world is different. Yet we have the mind of Christ. We are connected to the vine. The gospel has infiltrated the hearts and minds of disciples, and they think the way that Jesus thinks. And that's just incredible. And if that's really the case, then things must just go wonderfully for us all the time, right? Well, actually, no. Because verse 18 says, If the world hates you, Keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world, and that is why the world hates you. Come to Jesus so that the world will hate you. Do you ever see that on a bumper sticker or on a Super Bowl commercial? The world hated Jesus. That is a fact. The one who was without sin and lived perfectly to bring glory to God was despised by mankind. They hated him. They hated him and they killed him. To be a Christian is to be united with Christ. It is to be connected to the vine. But not only will we experience the love of God and the joy that comes from being loved and the fruits of the Spirit, but we will also experience the fruit of persecution. To be like Jesus is to be persecuted like Jesus. To be united to Jesus is to be hated by the world like Jesus. 
Sometimes we can think that if we're just kind enough, or if we're just loving enough, or if we're just gentle enough in the way that we talk about Jesus to people, then the people will love us for it. Well, are you more loving than Jesus? Are you kinder than Jesus? Are you more gentle than Jesus, of whom it was said a bruised reed he would not break? To think that we could represent Jesus accurately and have the world still love us is to believe that we're better than Jesus. Verse 20. Remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. To think that you could represent the gospel accurately and still have the world love us would be to think that we, as the servants of God, are greater than Jesus, who is the master. So third principle. True disciples of Jesus are hated by the world. True disciples of Jesus are hated by the world. Now, I'm not saying we should go and try and make people angry. I'm not saying we shouldn't be loving, or we shouldn't be kind, or we shouldn't be gentle. But I'm saying we don't have to try to make people angry. We don't have to try. To be with Jesus is to be hated by the world. The last 2,000 years of church history has made this very clear. So how does this affect you? How does it affect you to know that the world is full of people who only have human wisdom? And they think that what you believe is utter foolishness. Does that scare you? Does it weigh you down? Well, here's the thing, and this is verse 19. If you are in Christ, you do not belong to the world. You do not belong to the world. God has chosen you out of the world. So don't be afraid to be hated by the world because it means you are loved by Christ. It means you have been chosen by God. It means you are connected to the vine, the wellspring of eternal life. The all-powerful God has chosen you to be his friend. And to the glory of God, and you will bear much fruit. Let's pray. God, I, um, I thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit, for the love of Christ demonstrated in this passage for people who don't deserve it. Thank you for the way in which Christ's love is the model and the example for how we ought to love others. It's the perfect illustration of grace and mercy, and kindness, and to be considered yours, to be your friend, to be connected to you is the greatest privilege any of us could ever want or need. I thank you for your love towards us when we didn't deserve it. You are the great God who has become our friend and I thank you for that. Amen. See you guys next week.